Good. That is very sweet. <clears throat> I was, <clears throat> excuse me. I was going to say that uh, for those of you who don't know, I, my name is Glenn Parkinson. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. It is absolutely great to be back. <clears throat> I want to thank you for just a, a mountain of prayers that have gone up and, and cards and visits. Mickey and I are both very, 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 very grateful. And uh, special thanks to a, a wonderful staff that's gotten along quite well without me. Um, today we're going to start <clears throat> an Easter study. Now don't worry, we haven't forgotten about Daniel, but it's now Easter. So as we run up to Easter, <clears throat> we're going to dive into Jesus' last prayer with his disciples it's often called high priestly prayer, historically. Um, and here's Jesus on the night <clears throat> of the, his arrest interpreting the impact of what he's about to do. Dying on the cross and rising again. <clears throat> and our topic this Easter season is the theme, I believe, of this prayer, which is eternal life. So uh, let's uh, begin with verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I'm just going to keep going with this, and we'll, we'll get it eventually. Uh, I'm going to go back to verse <clears throat> 2, where Jesus says that he gives eternal life to those whom the Father gives him. Jesus says he gives eternal life. Well, he gives it to people, obviously, who are already alive. He doesn't create people. Um, he gives eternal life. Uh, to people who have, are already in existence, who live. So obviously then, for Jesus, the idea of life in general is a larger thing than what he calls eternal life. There must be some kind of life before eternal life. And uh, Scripture says that all people will live forever, but only some will have eternal life. Well, how does all of that work? How does it work? Perhaps it would be good for us in this study if we kind of step back uh, before we really jump into this text and sort of frame the text with a broader understanding of what the Bible says about the whole sweep of human life and then how eternal life fits into that uh, scheme. Thanks. While society's view of the size of the universe has been getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, our view of the significance of humanity has grown smaller and smaller and smaller. We used to think that people lived forever, and uh, the universe was relatively small. Now we see that the universe is much larger than we ever imagined. And somehow, our society is drawing the conclusion that people, uh, then they, we aren't infinite. We don't live forever, and, and we're only a flash and, and that winks out of existence very quickly. And the bigger the universe, the less significant, the less permanent uh, human beings are. Well, my childlike brain has never really understood that connection. Now, in third grade... Uh, I had a field trip. I went to New York City. And I remember standing, the wall was right there. I remember standing right at the base of the Empire State Building and looking up. I mean, it was just the biggest thing, bigger than anything I'd ever imagined, okay? But when I saw that, that didn't make me feel like less of a person because grown-up people built this thing, right? Don't be oppressed by the size of the universe. After all, you are contemplating it. It's not contemplating you. It's important that we regain a biblical appreciation of what life is, human life, before we try to understand the eternal life that Jesus says he gives on top of that. What I'm going to do today, I'm going to display some uh, biblical passages, a number of them, as we kind of take an overview of human life. Uh, and I just urge you to open your mind to truths that you are not going to hear anymore anywhere else except in church. For example, Ephesians 1, Paul talks about <clears throat> being chosen in him before the foundation of the world. <clears throat> I 
our stories begin, in a sense, our lives begin long before we are born, before the creation of the world, in fact. God may have generically planned to create lions and tuna, but his plan for humanity involves specific individuals, people he could choose. Think about that. The complexities of that are mind-boggling to plan ahead for specific people individually. The Bible is clear that you and I, we were designed as a part of God's plan for the universe. Jesus says that when he returns, uh, there's going to be, he's going to give names to people. And these names are the names that God gives us. Only God knows them because only God knows the entirety of our design and why we're here. It's like you know, knowing all of our DNA and, and our spiritual DNA and everything about us, he knows. So he can give us the perfect name. God told Adam to give names to whole species. But God has picked out specific names for individual people. And biblically, names are intimate things. They reflect the specific character of people. God knows our place in his story. His story. Our place in his story. Tragically, uh, we are lost. We don't know who we are. We struggle to define ourselves. But God has already defined who we are. Jeremiah understood that God knew him before he was born. God knew who he was before he was. And he set him apart for a particular purpose. Both he and the Apostle Paul were blessed to discover themselves. They discovered themselves in the context of God's eternal plan. That's who they were. And God not only planned our role, he designed the specific difference each one of us could make. Could make given the gifts that he gives us and the opportunities that are available in our slice of history. Years ago, Mickey and I worked very hard one summer to uh, discover who we are in God's plan. And I know that uh, we've only discovered just a little slice, I think, of our names. But I do know, for example, I know that, uh, that God made me to communicate the beauty of his truth. That's the, the phrase I came up with. Uh, that's at least a part of who I am. And I, I, I can't wait to discover who all you are as well. Maybe some of maybe you know. All of God's people lived, lived in God the way a child lives in his or her mother's womb long before we were actually born. Long before we experienced the lives that we were given. And surely then this must be true for everyone in some sense. That people exist in God before creation, long before we experience life. That's true for every human being. Are you starting to see how profoundly different the Bible's concept of what it means to be human is from what you get in the secular world? It's a huge difference. The first human being to experience life <clears throat> that God had designed was Adam, his unique creation, reveals what makes up a human being in space and time. A human being has a spirit from God that is like God in miniature and a body made of the physical elements of creation, of this planet. A human being is a combination of physical molecules with something that is not physical, a spirit, a soul, imprinted perhaps on the brain as a unique design, a unique pattern that is different and distinct for each of us. And it's distinct from the particular molecules that express at any given time. To think that a human being is only his body is not biblical. We are more than our bodies. Not only are we more than our body's limitations, we are more than our bodies, period. God breathed a reflection of himself into the dust of the earth. And the result was Adam and then Eve and then eventually you and me. Conversely, to think of a human being as being essentially a spirit or a soul with the body not essential, that's wrong too. It's an old Christian heresy that taught that salvation releases us from our material bodies to live as spirits in heaven forever. It's amazing how many Christians still believe that. 
The Bible doesn't teach that at all. We're not going to be destined to live as spirits in heaven forever. God didn't make us to be just spirits. The Bible teaches that a human being consists of two parts, an outer material body and an inner immaterial soul or spirit. And these two things are fused together to make a human being. Now, you'll notice that I've been speaking about spirit and soul as essentially the same thing. There are those who argue that a human being is made up of three parts, body, soul, and spirit. And they argue that off the basis of several text, uh, selected texts, and I respect their sincerity tremendously, but I'm not convinced at all because both words have a large range of meaning. In fact, when you look at where they're used together, it's very clear to me that the author here is poetically expanding an idea by saying the same thing in different words. This is very common in Hebrew, uh, Hebrew uh, poetry. Um, so these words are either synonyms or very, very close to it. Uh, in fact, I have actually looked at every single use of both spirit and soul in the entire Bible, and I can't find any way that they consistently define different things. Most of the time, they seem interchangeable. Now, I once had a professor who claimed that the difference was grammatical, that a person has a soul and is a spirit. And I thought that was extremely profound. And I like it, but I'm not even sure that distinction always works. I think that these two words are, are looking at the same thing from different, uh, different perspectives. There's two words for it. You could, you, could look, you could talk about the color green, or you could talk about an electromagnetic wavelength of about... 540 nanometers. Those are very different ideas. But they refer to the same thing. And you could talk about the body, or you could talk about the flesh. You have different words. They're a little bit different, but they're talking about the same thing. I don't claim to fully understand the difference in perspective between spirit and soul. But the important thing, and this is borne out in the Genesis 2 creation of Adam, is that we are, we are two fused elements. An outward body that and an inward spirit or soul. And both are essential to be fully human. This is amazing stuff. Our, our, our lives actually began in the mind of God where he defined what we are intended and ought to be. We begin to experience our own lives when he actually creates that spirit he designed, fuses it with a body that's perfect for it when, in fact, we are born. Now, the problem is, as you know very well, that God's plan, God's design, has been radically compromised. That's the story of the fall. That's the story, well, of human history. Because part of God's image is the ability to choose. And humanity has used that ability and chosen to essentially ignore our creator. Instead, we, you know, we insist that we can create or define ourselves. That's what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is all about. The choice to design our own lives after God has already done so is the essence of all sin. The very basic outline of his design remains in our, in our fallen human conscience, and we violate that conscience just about every day. God designed us to be entirely like him in miniature, good, and faithful, and just, and merciful, with consistent integrity and goodwill. Imitating God by creating things with our bodies that make the invisible aspirations of the soul visible in creation, which is what God does, why he created the world. But we invariably choose our own interests over the interests of others, not even caring what God wants, and we compromise justice, and we compromise our integrity, and we compromise every good thing that we were meant to be. And what we create is warped by the desires inside that are warped. And God's purpose and God's plan for each of us goes completely unknown and undiscovered by millions of people. Because apart from Christ, we want to want what we want. We don't want to want what God wants. Sin created something that wasn't there before. It's called death. It brought death to human experience. I'm not saying there wasn't the death of animals and plants or whatever, but this brought death into human experience. But you got to now think about it. If human, if human beings are two different parts, then death 
is going to have two different meanings for human beings. Two different meanings. One for the body and another for the soul. Our material bodies die. And they break down, just like all the other creatures, animals and plants. Dust returns to dust. But what does it mean for the soul to die? It isn't material. It doesn't turn to dust. Well, notice what it says here, that God declared Adam would die on the day he sinned. But what happened on the day he sinned? He was cast away. His fellowship and his relationship to God was broken. His body didn't keel over until much later. From the perspective of his soul or spirit, Adam did die the day he sinned because that's when he lost his fellowship and relationship to his creator. That is what death means for the soul. It's losing our personal connection with our creator. Some families are so broken that parents may say of children or children may say of their parents, they are dead to me. Well, they each know that they're both physically alive. The statement refers to their relationship. When a relationship is dead, then spiritually one person is dead to another, even though the bodies are still working. And even though the souls are still working, they aren't working together. In an ultimate sense, a spirit is dead when it is unable to relate to God the Creator. It is quite possible then for a spirit's body, excuse me, it is quite possible then for a person's body to be alive and their spirit to be spiritually dead. And in fact, the New Testament says that we are dead to God in our sins before we are saved. So death means different things for the two different parts of a human being. In this age, when our bodies die, the body and the soul are wrenched apart. The body breaks down into dust. The molecules don't cease to exist, but they're no longer connecting to a soul. The soul doesn't cease to exist either, but it becomes invisible to the material world. It has no bodily interface with the material world, no, eye, no eyes to see, no hands to touch, but it still exists. Whether it's dead to God or not, it still exists. Resurrection, a term for the body, consists when our body comes to life again and is refused to a soul, connecting it to the material world. The soul can see again, it can touch, it can act. But of course, even the resurrection of a body does not automatically bring a soul to life in the sense of knowing God. How does a soul come alive? Well, the bodily term is resurrection. The, sp the spirit or soul term is rebirth or being born again. And that's the eternal life that we'll talk about that Jesus uh, gives us. That's a lot. Why do we believe this? Why do we believe what we just got finished saying? Because Jesus rose from the dead. That is the foundation of our faith. A Christian believes that. We're going to be celebrating it at Easter. If he rose from the dead, then everything he said in the Bible says is, is true. It vindicates it. But even more than that, Jesus' experience per perfectly tracks with the Bible's teaching about human life. As a man, he died. His body stopped working, began to decompose. His human spirit became detached, but it didn't cease to exist. After three days, he arose, and his soul and body were refused again. In perfect fellowship with God, now he's going to have a body, he says, is glorified, that perfectly expresses the spirit. Consider what this means for a believer who has fellowship with God right now. In this age, everybody's body dies and will be resurrected on the last day. But for the believer, the soul dies never dies. We used to be dead in our sins, but we were reborn. So when the body dies, the soul remains alive. Okay? So they, we never lose the fellowship that we have regained with the Lord. 
even when our body dies, our soul does not. The relationship with God is unaffected. This is exactly what Jesus taught. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. You ever wondered about this? I mean, is he contradicting himself? Do we die or not? The reason this makes sense is because he's talking about death from two different perspectives of the body and the soul. Speaking of the body, even though you die, yet shall you live because you'll be resurrected. And that's true for everyone. But speaking of the soul, everyone who lives and believes in me, their soul is alive, they will never die. For the believer, the reborn soul, never loses fellowship with the Lord. So it never dies. I mean, Christian, your body will die one day until Jesus comes back, but your soul will never die. The person that is you will never be separated from the Lord for one second. Think about that. It completely transforms a Christian's attitude toward dying. The Spirit never dies once we know him. Jesus clearly taught, and this is from our responsive reading, that when he returns to set things right, everyone is resurrected. All bodies and souls refused so that we stand in our own two feet before God on the day of judgment. Some are raised to judgment, some raised to what he calls life. Some will be raised with spirits that are dead, some with spirits that aren't, uh, that are alive. And then he says that every single person will go on. Every single person will go on, one way or another, forever. Either with a soul that remains disconnected from God, and with all the anguish that entails, or with a soul that has been reborn and is alive to God and will live with him in a renewed earth forever. It's a lot to absorb. But our goal today is to put the eternal life Christ gives in a larger context. God's word disagrees with those who say that human life flashes for an instant and then goes dark forever in an infinite soulless universe. The biblical view of human life is enormous. God's word says our lives began in him long before we got to experience them, and each one, each one of us, will go on forever. Now, next week, we're going to look at how Jesus gives eternal life and able to restore a soul. But let's take this week to contemplate what it means for every human being to be immortal. Now, only God is intrinsically immortal, but his sovereign design and power has made every human being to live forever. That is a huge fact that is unappreciated today. People do not live expecting that to be and live accordingly. There's a tremendous, you may have seen a tremendous quote from C.S. Lewis. I got to read it. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life to ours is as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with and work with and marry and snub and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. What God designed people to be has nothing to do with their circumstances in this fallen world. Everybody had a divine purpose at one time. Anyone could have it again in Christ. Toothless, grimy cast-offs full of fear in the city bear no resemblance to God's original design. But if Jesus gives them eternal life, if he reconnects them to God's design, you will be astounded at what they will become when they are resurrected what they're going to be forever. I think it was Lewis again who said, if you actually see somebody when they're glorified, you'd be tempted to worship them. Why not? They're going to be like Jesus. 
Why do I believe that? Because look at Jesus Christ. He was poor. He was a failure. He was mocked. He was, he was executed. But he rose as Lord with authority over everything. He's our model. On the other hand, even the most successful among us bear very little resemblance to God's original design. Such folks are able to do something with their lives, but what they choose to do is to invest themselves in things of no eternal consequence because their goals are designed to only please themselves. You realize that even working for humanity is an unworthy goal if you do it just to please yourself. Last week I saw a YouTube video of a of an interview is with an, a famous astrophysicist. You've probably seen him. He's a wonderful, wonderful teacher, and uh, he was on a national talk show. And he said, clearly to Larry King, he said, I don't want to live forever. He said he just wanted to justify his life by doing something he considered to be great. And I almost wept because I admire this man. And I know that he is going to live forever, whether he likes it or not. And he doesn't get to set the terms of how he's going to justify his life. That is for God to decide, and he'll decide it on the basis of his relationship to him. The Lord has laid this man on my heart. I'm going to have to try to contact him. You know, every, every once in a while, this is an aside, the Lord just lays somebody on my heart. Sometimes it's somebody, you know, I see around me. Sometimes it's somebody I see on television. And I have to try to contact them uh, just to get the gospel to them. I don't usually hear back. Sometimes I do. But I want to encourage you with this. If God lays somebody on your heart, it could be somebody at work or in your neighborhood. It could be somebody on television. And you lays them on, find out some way to communicate. I mean, send them a letter. Send them a Bible. Somehow get the gospel to them because that's a way of, that's a way of taking them seriously. Next Sunday, we'll get back to John 17, and we're going to start to feast our way through the text. But today, we've simply put eternal life in a larger context. Eternal life gets immortal people back on track with God. Next week, we'll start to unpack that. And so as an assignment this week, this would be a great conversation to have. This is something you have to do with somebody else. Have a conversation. What difference does it make to be immortal? Okay. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us to see people the way Jesus saw people. He wasn't put off by their hopelessness, born of poverty or homelessness or lack of education or anything else. And neither was he fooled by people convinced they can justify themselves with no need to ever answer for their choices. He could look at anyone and he could see his father's original design that would make them glorious. And he knew exactly how to reconnect them with that intended glory. I know he wasn't put off or fooled by me. I know, Father, he saw what I was supposed to be, but wasn't. And how he inspired me to faith, gave me eternal life. My only goal right now is to use that life to make him glad he did. But, Father, I pray you would give us all a bigger view of what it means to be human, bigger than the thought that we're simply animals driven by primitive impulses, here today, gone tomorrow, forever, free from an obsession with bucket lists that turn life into a race to pleasure ourselves at maximum speed. Lord, open our eyes to the eternal story each precious person is writing. And please give us the privilege of watching your son give eternal life, changing a story from an ending of a mortal horror to one of everlasting splendor. We ask it in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Amen.